Then we are also, instead of Patty, we're going to um, use uh, Judith McClarsky at this point. She was born and raised in Orlando. She received a Bachelor of Science degree in laboratory technology from Auburn University in 1982 and received a Doctor of Veterinary Medical degree from the University of Florida in 1986, making her your classmate. They go, they go way back. For the last 19 and a half years, she's had a mobile small animal practice in um, a county here in Florida that I can't pronounce, in Daytona Beach. For the past decade, she has attempted to inform local, city, and county officials about public health implications of feral cats, especially where rabies is concerned. In the last two years, that concern has included Orange County, with notification to the state's elected officials. Judith is married to her high school sweetheart. They have two grown sons and two grandchildren. Their firstborn is a sergeant in the U.S. Army and is presently en route to his third deployment. So let me introduce Judith and Arnold. Dr. Judith Mokarski. Can you hear me? Projection is usually not a problem for me. Okay. Rabies may have been what got me into this uh, concern, but I'm not here today to talk about rabies. I'm here to talk about something else. I would be grateful for a show of hands for those of you who have a homeless human population in the cities where you reside. Are homeless, homeless, where are there homeless people? So maybe the be thank you, maybe the better question I should have asked is, who doesn't have a homeless population in your town? I'd be grateful for a chance to talk to you about this before the conference is over. And now I'd like to see a show of hands for the people who have a homeless cat population in your area, stray cats, wild cats, feral cats. Who doesn't have a feral homeless cat? I'd like to talk to you before we're done. Uh, oh, you have coyotes, yeah. <laughs> Are you in Arizona? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah, they, they, they do that. <laughs> Where I live now in Volusia County, Daytona Beach, the homeless people are eating the feral cats. And I know this because a person who was homeless and who was eating the feral cats told this to me. And he told it to me at the same time that he told a group of high school students for whom I was the business partner this past spring. And he told the students that the cats were a recognizable form on a grill. And after his presentation, we were walking out and he turned to me and he said, Judith, I know that sounded horrible. And I want to assure you that the days that we could find hamburgers in the dumpsters, we didn't eat the cats on those days. So after his presentation, the teacher for whom I was the business partner took me and our guest speaker to lunch. And I shared with them a concern um, that I had come across when I first started worrying about the feral cats um, eight years ago. And that is the concern between association between toxoplasmosis and schizophrenia. And I didn't do anything with it at that time. And eight months before this gentleman's presentation, a colleague had brought this concern to me again and I piddled around with it a little bit and decided, no, I, I don't want to touch that. But for me, this gentleman who had actually eaten the feral cats, this was my tipping point. I'm going to leave that lunch conversation for a minute and, and go on to, to these two seemingly unrelated topics. And let me start with schizophrenia. Um, how many people in this room have a working knowledge of this serious mental illness? OK. How many people in this room know a person who has schizophrenia? Okay, anybody in here um, work in the field of mental health? Anybody here work with the mentally ill? Okay, I'm coming at this from the lens of veterinary medicine. So I have done an intensive amount of reading on this subject. I'm going to share with you what I know. In the world of mental illness, it starts on one hand with clinical depression, 
It moves on to consider bipolar, bipolar disorder, which is mania combined with depression in the same person. It moves on on the far end with schizophrenia, which typically the hallmark of that is hearing voices. And somewhere in between is now a hybrid condition, excuse me, called schizoaffective disorder, which takes components of both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia in the same individual. We used, to, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, is that better? We used to think of this as a continuum. And recently I have heard this described as more of a grid situation. And I've also heard that we are not, no longer trying to pigeonhole patients into a specific diagnosis, but rather to consider that these are diseases that are hereditary. Only 1% of people with, with serious mental illness do not have a family history. And we're also concerned with brain chemistry. There are now 241 recognized chemicals that infect the brain, and those dealing with mental illness that we have medications to treat for, talk about acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, gamma aminobutyric acid, and serotonin, the five biggies, okay? Statistically, if you know 100 people, you know someone who has bipolar disorder. If you know 125 people, you know someone who has schizophrenia. So let me go back to this lunch. I shared with this guest speaker and the biology teacher this association. And they said, I had to sound the alarm. I needed to get the word out. So I did. The teacher helped me formulate a recipient list. This went out via email. This became public record. The mayor of Daytona Beach was on the list. He was actually the first to respond. Um, the chairman of our county council, the NAMI National Alliance for Mental Illness affiliate. Um, we had a number of people on this. And within 72 hours, multiple recipients informed me that they were sending this on to their various stakeholders. This was not something that was ever on my agenda. I stumbled on this and I was at a loss for where to go with it. So I started to share this information with the people in my world, especially my clients. And since I make house calls, most of the time those conversations were in kitchens. Um, I would like to share some of those responses with you because it ran the spectrum of human perception and also because I wasn't prepared for any of it. The first two that I found most interesting were actually clients who not only admit to feeding the feral cats, but they admit to feeding the raccoons while they're feeding the feral cats. And both of them thanked me for pursuing this because they said it would truly be better to euthanize a feral cat than to allow a homeless person to eat him. Now in this letter that I sent out, I had asked three questions. And the first was, who else knows that the homeless people are eating feral cats? I had a sneaky suspicion that I wasn't the only one figuring this out. The second question I asked was, those of us who have advocated for the witness death of feral cats by humane injection of barbiturate overdose have been labeled cat haters. What are we now? And the third question I asked was, are the chronically homeless descending further into madness because they're becoming infected with a parasite? Now let me go on to schizophrenia, uh, pardon me, toxoplasmosis. How many people in this room have a working knowledge of toxoplasmosis? Okay, how many people in this room have had children where you know that a pregnant mama has been told by her obstetrician, don't king the cat's litter box? Okay, that's the disease. So toxoplasmosis is a parasite, it's a protozoan, it's not a worm, it's a single celled organism. It's teeny weeny. You can only find it under a microscope if you're very lucky. The vet school has never diagnosed this under a microscope. It's, it's that hard to see. They diagnose it on serology. They look for antibodies to this. So this parasite comes in cat poop, or suborder felidae, anything that's a cat, a house cat, to a bobcat, to a puma, to a tiger, to a lion, all of them can carry this part of the phase of the organism in their feces. Cats and every, all other animals and people 
can get another stage in our tissues. So if you swim, fly, crawl, run, or walk, you can get toxoplasmosis. Mice and rats can get it, sea lions can get it, kangaroos can get it, and we can get it. So I know that sounds like an unlikely association, but there have been researchers over the last decade around the world, most notably in this country, it's been Johns Hopkins have been looking at that. If you want to read something about schizophrenia and you only have time to read one thing, please read Surviving Schizophrenia by E. Fuller Torrey, MD, whose sister has the condition and that's what got him into this. Okay, and he's leading the group at Johns Hopkins. So let me go on with what a few other clients had to say about this. A cardiology nurse said to me, the act of eating feral cats is not one of depravity. This is an act of desperation. A firefighter looked at me and said, of course they're eating feral cats. Why does that surprise you? A stay-at-home mom said, well, which problem do you fix first? The cats who may be infected with a parasite or the homeless people who are so hungry they have to eat them. A retired judge whose own kitty came out of a feral colony gave me a nonverbal. Googled, downloaded, copied, and mailed me an article on toxoplasmosis out of the Cornell Feline Health Center. An attorney who works in the public defender's office got this information and said for him this was an aha moment. Because a decade ago he was noticing that homeless people who he was initially helping with very minor trespass issues within three or four years he was having to Baker Act. And while he admitted that mental illness may have been what got them on the street in the first place, there was obvious decline over time. And he invested himself in psychiatric literature, interviewed a number of the area's psychiatrists, and for him there was still a big question mark. He said, did I have any idea that if we could do a study and if we got results, how far reaching the implications would be? An OBGYN had a two word response. Oh Lord. A restaurant owner said it in three words, shut the door. A primary care physician from Arkansas looked at me and said, what temperature do you have to cook meat in order to kill toxoplasmosis? It's 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 71 degrees C. A client who was in the middle of a major church fundraiser, the kind that if you don't get to go to the county fair, you go to this one, is reading this and says, looks up in the middle of it and says, what's the color for serious mental illness? I said, what? She said, you know, like the awareness colors, like breast cancer has pink. What's the color for mental illness? She waited a minute. She said, I think it should be gray. I've been this person's veterinarian almost 20 years. I had no idea where that was coming from. But I said, well, mental illness, brain, gray matter, okay, I get it. I've looked into that. Um, actually, gray is the color for asthma and serious respiratory illnesses, the color you turn if you don't get enough oxygen. And silver was proposed by the National Alliance for Mental Illness back in the mid-90s as the requested color for serious mental illness. Now that sounds odd because we think silver, that's something desirable and nobody wants mental illness. But the premise was with therapy and medication, there was a silver lining. There was a, a hope for a chance to normal life. I'm wearing a silver ribbon today. A minister whose church is on the circuit for the homeless when they go making the rounds and looking for handouts, took the opportunity to inform me that homelessness is a choice. A priest whose church runs a food pantry said, we need to get to the root cause. We need to find the root cause for a serious mental illness, and we need to find the root cause for homelessness. And he said, did I have any concept for the fact if we could do a study, and if we could get positive results on the study, that the ramifications could extend far beyond the United States. A nurse who works at our local treatment facility 
with adolescents pointed a finger at me and said, you, I'm talking you veterinarians need to prove that there is no association between toxoplasmosis and schizophrenia before one more feral cat gets put on one more elementary school campus. And that brings me to the next point. The homeless people are not the only vulnerable population in our society, so are the elementary school children. In my own city that I live, Port Orange, the first official feral cat colony of Port Orange is on the Horizon Elementary School campus, and this fact is celebrated on the Alley Cat Allies website. I'll get to my last client interaction. Was a police officer, did this. I left the force in 2009, and I knew about it then. The police officer and I then had a discussion about the fact that most people with serious mental illness are victims of crime. It's very rare when they become perpetrators. However, when you look at situations like the Gabriel Giffords incident, the Batman movie incident, recently the Navy shipyard incident, and I guess we're going to find out about what happened at the airport yesterday. These were all committed by young men who had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. So while they may be the outliers, when something happens, it happens in a serious way. And we discussed the situation about could it be possible that feral cats eliminating on playgrounds are infecting children, they're getting toxoplasmosis, they're getting schizophrenia. And I said, if this is the case, then the discussion is not one of gun control and the former cop cut me off and finished the sentence and said, this will be a discussion of animal control. Do I have time? Which leads me to the next point. I talked to a, another of our classmates who's in the next city south of me, New Smyrna Beach, and I said, if I could do a study on Port Orange and we could study the cats, because right now, we don't know if the feral cats in Volusia County are carrying toxoplasmosis. This is not something that we traditionally test for. Um, I diagnosed one cat 12 years ago. I remember where the kitty was. But we don't know if that's present right now. And we're not going to be testing people for this unless we have a reason to, unless we can prove it's in the animal. So I said to my cl other classmate, if I can do a study in Port Orange and we get results, would you consider repeating the test in New Smyrna Beach. And without missing a heartbeat, he said, that's ridiculous. If we're going to be sending samples, we need to be sending them from the two cities together. We share a health department. We have two different animal control authorities, and we have two different impoundment facilities. We were put in touch with the USDA NI researcher in Beltsville, Maryland, who is not just the expert in toxoplasmosis in this country. He's the world's leading expert on toxoplasmosis. He was on the team of scientists who discovered that cats carried that intestinal phase that they deposit in their feces. He agreed to pay for shipping and to handle the cost of testing. Our county's health department was willing to oversee this study to the point of watching us take samples if that's what was required to validate the study. The proposal was, could we please have the permission from our animal control authorities and the cooperation of our impoundment facilities that once these cats who had gone through traditional animal control impoundment and euthanasia, may we please sample the feral cats and send these samples to the toxoplasmosis researcher with USDA NIH. Let me start with Port Orange. My animal control authority said, once they've left our jurisdiction, it's up to the impoundment facility. The response from the director of the impoundment facility was, we are not going to cooperate with this study because it does not comport with our mission statement. This director went before my city council saying, and this is a quote, he was expressly hired to promote feral cats. Okay, I get it. If you're hired to promote feral cats, investigating or participating in a study that might incriminate feral cats with giving the most serious of mental illnesses to school children is probably not something you want to do. On the other side was New Smyrna Beach. We had a meeting with a representative of the health department myself and my classmate, the animal control officer, and the head of the impoundment facility. 
all of us represented completely different factions and we could not walk in each other's shoes. One of the m best meetings I've ever attended. And the animal control officer said, well, if you get positive results, then what? The health department said two things. Number one, if we start finding positives in the cats, we were one year away from getting the wheels grinding to be able to test humans. And the other thing he said was, we will, uh, the health department will address the homeless population as well as they will address the school children. And afterwards, I thanked him for that. And he's like, well, that's, that's our job. He said, a citizen's a citizen's a citizen, whether they're at a school playground or whether they're living on the street. My classmate made a formal presentation to the board of directors for his impoundment facility. The board of directors agreed unanimously the study needed to be done, but were evenly divided over it being done there for fear of harm to their reputation. They said, look, the economy's in the tank. We're bare bones as it is. We cannot afford to take a hit. I understand where they were coming from. Eight years ago, I was threatened by the Alley Cat Allies linked to Daytona. I know what that feels like. So that's where we are now. I'm going to wax poetic and say that the theme of this conference was the conversation starts with you. I'm grateful to Patty Strand. In my stenopad of life, there's a page with her name on it. And I'm also thankful to my classmate, Dr. Goldman, for allowing me to take some time out of his presentation. I would welcome your input. Thank you.